Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So I'm finally back in front of the camera, apparently, as you can see. And in today's video, I will show you how you can derive the mass continuity equation, which we'll need later on for the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equation. So the principles will be the same, but we will start with the mass conservation. I wanted to actually put them together at the beginning, but the video would have been too long and yeah, you would have just clicked away from the video. So I will just split them into two parts. So we have the mass conservation in this video. In the next video, you will see the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equation. And if you want, and if needed, I can derive the energy equation for you in case we deal with compressible flows. So I would say, without further ado, let's jump right into the presentation. But before that, let me tell you that at the end, if we derive the final form of the equation, which is that the divergence of our velocity field equals zero, I want to show you some animations to make it easier for you to understand what actually the divergence operator means in terms of a source, a drain, and the so-called vector field. So stay tuned, it will be a very interesting video, and I would say, let's go. Hey guys, so we're here now in the presentation, and let's go. So here in the first slide, don't be afraid. This is just a prerequisite for the following things we will derive. So a very important theorem is the so-called Reynolds transport theorem. And this is just about to state the general form of a conservation law. So as you can see, we have a control volume denoted by omega. And as you can see, we have a normal vector as well pointing out of the control volume. And F is the so-called flux, so it's not a force, but a flux into our control volume. Q indicates a source inside of our control volume. Ds is, if you like, an infinitesimal surface length. And below you can see the equation. And what you need to know is if the source inside of our control volume is zero, the evolution is only determined by the surface fluxes F alone. And you can see the integral formulation as I've already mentioned below. And this is the integral formulation. And what you have to take care of is that if you have a discontinuity in fluid mechanics, for instance, a shock wave, these integral formulas are quite handy and are way more convenient to use instead of a difference form, which we'll see later on. So here you can see what I just told you in a bit of a formula form, which states that the temporal variation of u inside of our volume omega is equal to the sum of fluxes across the surface S plus the contributions from our source Q or from our sources Q inside of omega. So the question is, uh, if we jump back, you can see that this force times normal vector is a surface integral. And in order to transform that into a volume integral, we can use Gauss's theorem or also known as the divergence theorem, which states the following that the surface integral from f times the normal vector times ds is equal to the integral of our control volume and we take the divergence of our fluxes inside of our control volume times the omega. This gives us the final integral form as you can see below. We can do some further processing to derive the differential form of this equation and taking the first equation going to the second, the assumption for the second formula is that the choice of our control volume omega is arbitrary. That means that the equation must also be valid locally at any point. So we can say that the last equation, we can just drag out d omega and we end up with a final form of d by dt times u plus the divergence of the fluxes equals the sources. The condition for the validity of this differential form is, as I already mentioned, the differentiability of the solution. That means if we have a discontinuity in our problem, for instance a shock wave, we should use the integral formulation. And this is also necessary. So the fundamental equations for fluid mechanics are as follows. We have the conservation of mass, of course, which we'll derive in this video. Then we have the conservation of momentum, as well as the conservation of energy. However, we don't have a look at the conservation of energy right now. This will be derived in a separate video, as well as the conservation of momentum, but we will need the conservation of mass derivation to get a deeper understanding on how the Navier-Stokes equation or the momentum equations are derived. 
Some recap from the CFD introduction video that I've already uploaded that we have the conservation of mass right here, where we have the first term is the change of mass in time, then we have the flow of mass through the boundaries, and this equals zero as mass is not created or destroyed. This is nothing else as the formula as I've shown you in the beginning, but just in a different form. Here, some recap about the conservation of momentum. We have the change in time, the convection term, which is nonlinear, and on the right hand side with the pressure and viscous forces plus extra forces. But we will go into more detail in the next video when we derive the Navier-Stokes equations. Here we have it rearranged and this is nothing else than Newton's second law of motion. And also note here that the V, the velocity vector, I have missed that in the CFD introduction. So please if you watched the CFD video or will watch it, make sure to think that there's a velocity component missing in the momentum equation. So recap about the terminology. We will focus now on a volume. So we take an infinitesimal volume right now and have a look at that. We will call that infinitesimal element or volume control volume. And the length of this infinitesimal element are denoted by dx, dy and dz respectively. So what does the conservation of mass state? It's nothing else that the temporal change of mass inside of our control volume is the flows into the control volume minus the flows out of the control volume. Don't be too scared. It's nothing too complicated. I will explain it step by step in a few seconds. So this only shows the fluxes inside of our control volume and the fluxes going out of our control volume. So for the moment, let's just focus on the x direction. On the left side, you can see that the mass flow is going into our control volume. And this is denoted by rho times u times dy times dz. And dy times dz is nothing else than the surface. On the right side, you can see the same quantity, but changing along the x. And this is what you can see right here. So we have the mass flow rate, rho times u times dy times dz, as I mentioned, through the surface A. And the quantity rho times u changes from x to dx with rho times u. And then you have the partial derivative in front of the brackets by dx times dx. So we just add that thing that changes or the term that changes and add it to the equation. So if we now have a look at a simple formulation, it's nothing else that the mass flow inside of our control volume minus the flow going out is equal to the change of mass per time. And we can rewrite the change of mass per time by saying d rho by dt times dx dy dz, where dx dy dz is nothing else than the volume of our control volume. So we just rewrite the first formula by taking the second formula and say that d rho times dt times our volume is equal to m dot in minus m dot out. Here we have the same equation as we have derived on the previous slide. And now we put in the equations that we have derived for the control volume. That means we have the left hand side, which is not changing anymore. And then what's going into our control volume is rho times u, as you might remember, of course, times dy times dz, but we will pull that out of the bracket and just focus now on the components without dy and dz. So as you can see, m dot in is rho times u and the flow going outside of our control volume or flowing out is as stated beforehand, rho times u plus the value that changes along the x. The same goes for the other directions, namely dy and dz direction. So here we have the same equation as from the previous slide and we can say that these cancel out, these terms. Then we can divide the whole expression on both sides by dx, dy, dz. And we'll end up with the following form. d rho by dt equals minus the three components, as you can see on the right hand side. And we can say, if we put everything to the left hand side, that this is nothing else than this expression right here. If we now take this expression in the next slide, and say that we have a look at an incompressible fluid in a steady state. That means there's no change of density in time. So this cancels out. 
if we have an incompressible fluid, we can pull out the density rho outside of the bracket and divide by the density. So we have on the right-hand side zero by density, so the right-hand side stays zero. And we have left du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz equals zero. If you rewrite that in a bit more convenient form, we can say this. So on the left-hand side, we have the same thing as on the previous slide. And if we use the so-called vector notation, we can write it in a bit more convenient way, which is that d rho by dt plus the divergence of rho times v equals zero. And as I mentioned, in terms of a steady state, incompressible flow, we have just that rho can be pulled out and the first term vanishes. So we have the divergence of our velocity field equals zero. So guys, as you have seen on the last slide, we have said that the divergence of the velocity field equals zero in case of an incompressible fluid having a look at the steady state. So I want to now explain in a little bit more detail and in a bit more intuitive way what this actually means. To show the animations and formulas, I want to make it a bit darker right here. Perfect. And right now we just rewrite the equation as we have seen on the last slide. And then we will have a look at the vector. So we can also write a vector arrow above the divergence operator, which is also called nabla. What we do next is we have to pay attention to the wording that I said. We said that the divergence is applied to a vector field or a velocity field in this case, which is nothing else than a vector field. So you might ask, what is a vector field? The question now is, what is a vector field? Okay, so let's say you have water flowing around and then you pick one fluid particle and you follow this fluid particle. And by following this fluid particle, it has a direction and a magnitude or speed. And this can be indicated by a vector. So if you do this for a lot of fluid particles, we get a velocity field. To make this a little bit more understandable for you, I want to show you an example, which is very well known from your day-to-day -day work, if you want to call it like that, which is a sink. So we have the water tap and we let water into the sink. And by letting water into the sink, we have nothing else than the source. This source of our water is indicated by arrows as well. And we have a drain where the water flows out of the system. Now, if we have a 2D top view of our sink, like looking on like from the top onto our sink, we can see that water accumulates first on one spot and then diverges away from the source. So we can say or draw that the arrows point outwards from the source because they go away from the source. On the other hand, we have the drain where water goes into the drain because it's a sink. We can also say that everything converges to this point. So from the source, we have it diverges away or it diverges from this point, and at the drain, the particles become denser in the sense of that they accumulate. So you will also see an animation right here, which shows you in a bit more intuitive way what this actually means. So if we now take the 2D view and redraw it, and have a look again at it, we will have a look at the middle. And if we now draw a control volume in 2D, or control plane to be more precise, you can see that, you will see that the divergence applied to this plane is nothing else than zero because the overall flow is zero because what goes in goes out. But if we have a look at the source side where the water flows into our sink, you will see that the divergence is bigger than zero because the arrows move outwards of the source. And we say that, I repeat again, that everything moves away from this source. So the divergence is bigger than zero, and in the middle we had the divergence equal to zero. So that means, if we look at the drain, that the divergence at the drain has to be smaller than zero. I hope that this was a bit more intuitive. I hope also that the animations, which I took from 3 Brew one brown so Grant Sanderson, helped you a little bit to understand this whole concept of what actually the divergence means. And actually, also, I will show you an animation what the divergence equals zero means in terms of fluid particles, where you can see that nothing becomes denser or converges away from a point. So, yeah, 
I hope that you liked the video, the introduction into the mass continuity equation. In the next video, I will show you how you can derive the momentum equation with a short, cool introduction at the beginning to classical mechanics. And as always, if you like the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, share it because sharing is caring, as you know, subscribe if you haven't already. And also, as always, make sure to keep engineering your mind. See you in the next one. Peace.